The next item is item number five, application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, docket number 15-2770, block 486, lot 980 Wooster Street in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District, a Beaux-Arts style store and storeroom building designed by G.A. Schellinger and built in 1894. This is an application to legalize the installation of mechanical equipment and a flagpole without Landmarks Preservation Commission permits. Good morning, Commissioners. Hillary Padgett, Preservation Department staff. This property is located on the east side of Wooster Street between Spring Street and Broom Street. Let's see there. And the designation photo here shows the building at the time of designation, and a current photograph shows the existing conditions at the front of the building. Uh, additional photographs here uh, show a mechanical unit that was installed at the third floor window ledge without an LPC permit. Uh, was issued a violation and, and has since been removed. The applicants are proposing to reinstall the mechanical unit in its previous location and also legalize the flagpole, which is located here. Uh, the co-op officer is here to present the mechanical unit and the architect is here to present the flagpole. Okay, thank you. My name is Cameron Laurie. I am with Architecture Restoration Conservation. Uh, we are the architects, um, we are actually usually referred to as RPC. Uh, we're the architects representing 80 Worcester Street. Um, we represent them with a, with a, on a series of violations and are now representing them on the uh, flagpole um, application. Uh, there are two parts to this presentation. We're going to review very um, quickly the warning letter um, and the response, or the response to our request to legalize as is, and then just talk very briefly also about a Flux House 2, um, 80 Worcester Street between Broome and Spring in context of the Cast Iron District um, and the, the context of the block and the context of the building in history along, along this block, and then talk specifically about the flagpole. At, uh, that is on in place now. Uh, first off, the warning letter, which was the, for the installation of the flagpole and banner without permits. Um, and yep, I'm missing. Seems to have been. But basically, the um, we were told that the they would not be able to legalize it as, as is because it is against the. Um, um, is not allowable as court for our rules and will need to be removed. Um, and the explanation that we got when we spoke with the, um, with the, um, uh, I believe it was the, the person who originally was responsible for the violation, was that flagpoles were no longer approvable because uh, too many had been approved in the district already. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly in terms of what we already know very much about um, SOHO uh, and the Cast Iron District. Uh, this is obviously a heavy concentration of very upscale, upscale retail stores. Um, this is a crowded and visually exciting place. You go there pretty much any time, the streets are full. Um, even in the middle of the winter, and you know, you'll go through and, and uh, West Broadway and Prince Street and all those streets are very crowded. Uh, there's a lot happening there all the time. Worcester Street between Broome and Spring is a little bit of a different story. Um, this particular block never became a prime retail block. To this day, it does not have the type of retail presence that you see all over, all over Soho. It doesn't have the foot traffic, it doesn't have the crowds, it doesn't have the visual sort of excitement of other places. Um, it clearly does not have the signage um, that other blocks have as well. This particular building is still fighting graffiti. Um, if you'll go, you know, last December when I was there, you know, I noticed there's acid etching on the glass. Um, every piece of metal at the building gets tagged. Um, their stone is actually getting tagged quite a bit. They're constantly, this is not, this is not West Broadway. Um, this particular block is, uh, is still a relatively quiet industrial block. Um, you know, it's, this, is, this is fairly typical you'll be able to look down the dump block and see relatively few people and relatively not a lot of in and out into the stores. 
Unfortunately, it is also used extensively as living quarters for, um, for transients as well. And in particular on this block, um, there are three flagpoles on Worcester Street. Um, the history of them we don't know. Uh, it's not like other parts of Soho where there's just flagpoles and signage and all of that um, going on. Uh, Worcester Street has, and I'm told this is a pointer, maybe not. Um, so, hmm? Top. Top the top, top one? Top one. Ah, okay, excellent. This is 80 Worcester Street, which has the flagpole that we've just mm -hmm. looked at. There are two other flagpoles, which is 67 Worcester, and on this building here, which is 60 Worcester. That's all the flagpoles, and I, I don't have any... Sorry about that. I have no idea what that is. And why it's ringing. How do you stop it? I just hit it. Shut it off. Somebody probably just wrong number. Isn't there? There's got to be a shut off here somewhere. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is the flagpole at 80 Worcester Street. Um, this is uh, one of the three is at 80 Worcester Street. The next one, which is at 67 Worcester Street, um, this was in December. It was windy. I don't know if it looked like that all the time um, or whether it's differently maintained. Um, but that's the, the second one that's, that's in place on the street. And the last one is at 60 Worcester Street. Um, this is it. I don't know what their, what, their, what their history is, but there's not a great deal of signage um, on that street um, because there's just simply not a lot of, um, it doesn't have the dense sort of retail demand for signage that other blocks have. This particular flagpole at 80 Worcester Street is very much, um, and this is, a, the, the, this is it in the, in the context of the, of the uh, entire building um, in terms of scale. I think it's fairly, it's fairly subdued against the block. This particular flagpole um, and is very much tied into, this is a, 80 Worcester Street have a very interesting history to it. Um, it is long considered one of the first artist residence, uh, artist and resident building in Soho. I think probably most of you have at least thumbed through mm -hmm. the illegal living 80 Worcester Street. Um, and it was chosen for that. There's a lot of reasons why this, that building was chosen as the subject for that topic. Uh, in 1967, uh, George Matunas, who's the found, founder of the Fluxus, Fluxus Movement, um, purchased the Avancing building with the help of a $20,000 grant from the JMK Kaplan Foundation and the Na National Foundation of the Arts. In 1974, Jonas Menkes, who's pictured here, purchased the ground floor space and moved his avant-garde film organization, Cinematique, into that, the ground floor in the basement. This sort of became ground, New York's ground zero for a, a network of artists and composers and designers um, that opened the definitions of art, what, what art could be. Um, and that space hosted, along with hundreds of others, Allen Ginsberg, Phil Glass, Yoko Ono, Andy Warhol, John Lennon, and this is a very active space. So in 1981, when George Sheckman purchased the space um, and opened the building up, he was broadening the geography of the gallery district and building on the history of this place. I mean, there's lots of buildings available that he could have chosen. He particularly chose this because of its, because of its history in Flex House too. And, um, and its history in the Fluxus movement. Um, and when he opened his gallery in 1981, as most gallery owners did at that time in Soho, he installed a flag, that's 30, about 33 years ago, um, to reach out from behind this industrial zone and pull people down into this area, hoping to encourage that kind of foot traffic that helped broaden the gallery district further. I want to talk a little bit about the flagpole as it is now. Um, the flagpole is, it meets zoning code resolution for height above the, the, the curb. Um, we understand that the flagpole needs to be a full two feet back from the curb, um, according to zoning regulations. Because of the way that it's situated now at angle, it, it, it's, it's basically meeting that requirement. Um, in that two feet, but I think it should have that full, that measurement needs to be confirmed 
um, because it should, will need to be that full two feet, but it otherwise meets what is allowable um, under regular zoning regulations. And with that, I want to thank you for your okay. attention. Questions now, thank you. Yes. Michael. All well and good. Two questions. Aren't we, aren't we being asked to also approve the reinstallation yes. of the AC in it? Mm -hmm. Both of yes. them. And, and oh. what's your argument for that? And despite the presentation, I don't see where in your presentation you're arguing why we should leave the flagpole. I mean, you, you made arguments against it. They're on the block, they're, poor, they're poorly utilized, it's this not a commercial block, why should we? I think that the, the, the argument is, is unlike other blocks where there's just an incredible amount of signage, this is a relatively quiet block. This is not overrun with signage, this is not overrun with, with retail space. This can support this type of signage without that busyness, without that, um, you know, and also this is a flagpole that um, I, has I mean, history to it. it has a history to it. What about the AC unit? The AC unit, we, ARC is not actually, uh, is not representing the building on the AC unit. The unit owner is here to make the presentation for the AC unit. So they go up, uh, okay, fine, then we'll come back to you, but Excellent. whoever's going to present it. Yes. Uh, Another question first. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, this is actually for Sarah. When was the district uh, designated? The, the district was designated, I think, in 1973. It's in the 1970s. And just to clarify the commission's policies and practices with respect to flagpoles in this district, the, in the early days, the commission did approve at staff level some flagpoles. Um, and that sort of happened through the 80s. By the 1990s, staff was no longer allowed to approve the installation of flagpoles and they always required a public hearing. So throughout the 1990s, the commission reviewed applications for the installation of flagpoles and by about 2000 began to feel as, as, and as we heard from the community, that the overwhelming amount of flagpoles started to distract from the architecture and obscure the architecture. And so the commission at that time adopted the bracket sign rules to encourage owners to do bracket signs instead of flagpoles. It would allow a projecting rigid sign that would give the visibility desired um, and would eliminate the need for flagpoles and setting the precedent for future flagpoles on a street. So, so that's sort of the evolution. Um, it began through the 90s. We began to scale back and by 2000, approved um, the bracket sign rules to encourage bracket signs as an alternative to flagpoles in this district. 81 or so, so. It, so I, I think that this is not the exact same flagpole that was there that's in the what, 80s. That was one of my questions, yeah. And having said that, the staff couldn't approve a flagpole. This is a question of appropriateness. And so appropriateness is something for you all to consider. So the history of a flagpole being installed in 1981 is something for you to consider in your consideration of this application. Yeah, so uh, sort of at that time, it might well have right. been approved, but it doesn't, given how it was installed, possibly it wasn't, but you know, but at least it's, yeah, it, it's very interesting, yeah. Thank you for the context. Yeah, and I don't know if you saw, I mean, we did go before Community Board 2. Yeah, we uh, have that. You I have that and you've read that. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. They, they're going to recommend approval. Okay. Yes, provided that it's shorter. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. Please, if you quickly do the air conditioner, someone. Thank you. Put your name on the record, please. Uh, good morning. My name is William Downey, and I'm the owner of the unit as the uh, air conditioner in question. I have a, <laughs> These photographs correspond to photographs in the handout you've been given. <coughs> and <coughs> in pages one through four of your handout, these are for context. These are all buildings on Wooster Street, and these are the typical win window air conditioners that are installed with no permit needed. <clears throat> As you can see, they all, depending on the depth of the window and the particular architectural configuration, stick out from the facade of the building by anywhere from uh, a foot to three feet. 
they all almost all have some sort of support unit or they uh, have a deep enough window ledge that they use the window ledge itself as the support unit. You can also see this would be on <coughs> the lower unit of page three of your handout, how these units never fill the exact window space and require blanked out things on either side to fill the space. Could you show us the unit you're proposing? Because yeah. that looks very different. <coughs> This is the unit as my unit as it was installed. It is what's called a mini split or ductless air conditioner. This is the compressor portion, <clears throat> which is connected through two half inch copper tubes to a distribution unit inside the loft at the back of the loft. I chose this because with window units, at least, and with my particular configuration, <clears throat> the window unit is providing most of its cold air where I don't need it, which is the front of the loft. I need it at the back of the loft, which is my living space and sleeping space. <clears throat> is there a window at the back of the loft? Pardon? Is there a window at the back of the loft? No. It's, it's a half floor kind of thing. It's, yeah, it's a, about a third of the floor. We have no access to the back of the there's building. There's no courtyards, there's no other windows in your space no. except for these three in front. Right. <clears throat> Next door, I'm on the third floor. Next door is a three story building. And how many floors in this building? My, our building is seven. So you've got four floors up. Yep, four floors up. Now, <clears throat> this is the unit, as I said, as installed. And I think in uh, picture number. Five, you can see the difference between this unit and a conventional unit on the fifth floor above. My unit is virtually flush with the facade of the building. It doesn't stick out at all. And in <coughs> the following uh, pages six, seven, and eight, you can see that the building, or that the unit is not mounted on the building. There's no attachment between this unit and either the brickwork or the cast iron elements. Can I ask a question, sir? Sure. Is this building a co-op or a condo? Co-op. Co-op. What are the co-op rules on central air conditioning? Uh, we have no particular rules on central air conditioning. We only have... Does anyone Anyone the top building? floor has central air. Yeah. Where's their units? On the roof. They own the roof. The roof is not a common area. It's not a common area. There's no common space on the roof at all. No, no, no. no egress, no nothing. No, no. no water tower, elevator bulkhead. Elevator bulkhead. That's the only thing that's on the top floor. <coughs> pictures are to give you an idea of now that the unit is removed. This is the window ledge, 17 inch concrete window ledge, 110, 15 years old, where the unit sat. <coughs> this is a close up of the base of the unit. It has these built in feet that mm -hmm. elevated about two inches above the window ledge itself, one in each corner. Those feet are the only point of contact with the building. This is the three inch wide strip at the bottom of the window frame that allows the copper tubes to pass through. You can think of this as analogous to those blanked out <coughs> pieces of wood that are used to fill in the space on either side of a conventional window air conditioner, except being only three inches high, this is not visible from the street. And the final two pages of the handout I gave you are simply a, a comparison of this type of unit with the conventional window air conditioner. 
where I think that this type of yeah. unit, if it can be installed in accordance with the rule that it can be installed simply by opening the bottom half of a double hung window, as this was, that it represents good public policy for the, the city of New York. The energy efficiency ratio rating of this unit is 18. The last page in your handout is taken from the internet and it is a list of the Energy Star rated window air conditioners of comparable size. And you will see that the best is 9.4. So this unit uses half the electricity of a comparable conventional window unit. And instead of sticking out from the facade of the building by two feet, it's virtually flush. And in my opinion, less disruptive of the architectural rhythm of the building. So, any questions? Further questions? Thank you. Yep. I have one question. Hold on. You said that it was not attached at all. Is it attached to the building in any way? Well, uh, the back of the unit obviously invisible in these photographs. There are two quarter inch bolts through that slot in the feet that act as safety anchors, uh, similar to all the props that hold up. Okay. So is it going in, so it's going into that ledge? Yeah, I, actually I was quite lucky that one of them was already there. These old buildings, in Soho are studded with old bits of hardware on the <coughs> exterior, like raisins in a fruitcake. Uh, I, on my other window ledges, I have bits of hardware whose origin I have no, and use I have no idea. If you walk down the street and, and look up a little, you will see cleats, eye bolts, abandoned pipes, all kinds of bits of iron machinery <coughs> left over from the uh, industrial days and so forth. Okay. Um, yes. So in terms of um, finishes, does it come with something other than white? No. Um, of course, it's a little more conspicuous because it hasn't, was only up for one season and hasn't acquired the obligatory Pacino. New York grind. Pacino, yeah. but all the exterior components of all air conditioners have to be a light color because they're dumping heat. If, you, if they were painted a dark color, then you have this unit trying to dump the heat that it's extracted from the interior, but it's also attracting radiant heat from the sun. That's why all of these units are kind of that anonymous hospital beige. Okay. North or south facade on the west. West. Further questions? Then uh, we'll go to the well. Testimony is. Thank you very much. Community Board Two. Landmarks and Public Aesthetics Committee <laughs> recommends approval of the long-standing banner and approval of the window air conditioner, but would prefer a shorter flagpole. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Barbara Zay of the Historic Districts Council. The equipment installed without LPC permits is an unfortunate intrusion on this Beaux-Arts style of store building. Had the project come before, forward beforehand, alternate locations and or systems would have been discussed and HDC asks that those issues now be addressed to find a more appropriate result. We also find the illegally installed flagpole out of keeping with the building and the historic district. Years ago, the commission sought to stem the proliferation of flags and banners that were cluttering Soho streetscapes and began not approving such accretions. Luckily, this policy has largely continued and the thriving district is better for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Anything further to add from either team here based on that testimony? I think our arguments are just clearly on opposite sides. So. Yep, okay. Discussion, thank you. All righty, I, I think had the flagpole been more recently installed in the period when it would have required a, um, a, sta a, a commission level uh, review, I, I think that I might have taken a stronger position against it, but I think the fact that it does date back to a time when it could have been approved at a staff level, I think that it, 
it perhaps should should be allowed to stay without expressing any precedent for uh, for it because frankly the arguments made by the applicant seem to me to point in the other direction the fact that the block is quiet in, res in residential or industrial the fact that um, that it's not a major commercial space seems to argue for the desire to preserve that quality and not to allow it to be depleted and made more, more similar to the more commercial areas uh, of, of the district. Uh, but I think that there is a reasonable uh, uh, extenuating circumstances to, to think about it as being grandfathered. Uh, the air conditioning unit poses a different question and I understand the applicants, I think from a technical point of view, the applicants arguments are are reasonable that these units are. You know, what's the difference between that beige box and this beige box? And I think that the difference is that there is a spectrum, a technical spectrum between a window fan and, and, a, and, a, and a cooling tower. And um, a window air conditioner, we have, because it is temporary, because it is sometimes but not always taken out seasonally, um, is considered below our area of general interest um, and is generally not uh, required to be approved, um, whereas a central unit is required to be approved. And this technology, the Mitsubishi type units, are kind of straddling the fence between the two. And as such, they are kind of unusual. But I think the defining thing that makes this different from the window units is the fact that once it's in, it's in. You don't take it out. You don't move it. No, I'm not aware of anybody taking down Mitsubishi units. And you've got to think of what the reality of, of the city would be like if, like in many European cities or, or, or others, other parts of the world where Mitsubishi units are quite, quite a bit more prevalent than window units are, what the effect would be. I mean, and God knows it's bad enough with the window units, and, and they certainly don't set a very nice precedent. But, be, but because they are intrinsically removable, and temporary uh, and are often, in fact, in fact, are removed seasonally, I think that, that, that this does deserve a different level of scrutiny. Um, I think that the, uh, the unit in question could have been recessed to the inside behind a louver. Um, you could take that light out and put a louver there or just raise the light up and put a louver under it and then ha set this on a shelf inside. That's, it's feasible, it's not particularly pleasant to the interior, but it's, it's feasible. I think um, that the amount of solar heat gain as a result of painting it would be relatively minuscule and the unit could probably handle it. Um, and I think that in buildings of this nature, central air units are usually positioned on the roof uh, and that, that I think because of these possible alternate methods, uh, I would say that, that we shouldn't at this time, uh, uh, I would feel less comfortable approving the AC unit. May I comment on? No, no not now. We'll, we'll, we'll finish all this and then we can. Okay, uh, I uh, in general concur uh, with uh, Michael's remarks. I mean, I think that that's why I was interested to find out the history that uh, Sarah was able to provide about the installation of flagpoles in the district. I do feel uh, that the fact it was, there was a historic flagpole here in uh, subsequent to designation, but in a period when if we had been hearing it, we would have permitted it. Uh, and the staff could have permitted it. Um, that um, I think, and the f I, I, I think it is okay to retain the flagpole. I would be uh, interested in having the staff look and see if there's any way to minimize the current. Uh, they said there was some damage to the facade as a result of uh, it, its mode of installation. And anyway, so uh, perhaps the staff might look at that to see if that situation could be improved. Uh, and as far as the air conditioning unit, uh, although it is a kind of an in-between one, one type and another, I also feel that uh, given there's not a lot of other places of, to position it, I mean, at that, and that there are other uh, for that particular uh, unit, and that also uh, there are a number of other air conditioning units on the street. It's a very common practice. This one is a little more visible because of what it is. Uh, and I guess Michael's raised the possibility of, you know, 
making camouflaging it a bit. Uh, but I do think that, uh, that the fact that it's uh, removable and uh, that we do permit air, I mean that air conditioning ex units exist all over the place uh, through the facade uh, in, and through windows. And I think uh, that this isn't so different uh, that I'm unwilling to, uh, <coughs> to uh, support it. Flag, the pole. Uh, the flag pole uh, is placed on the back, uh, on the history of it. I think I could move it. I think that it's maybe longer than it needs to be, and maybe it could make the pole itself shorter and still have the flag pole. But I, I think that's the only Okay. Michael. Um, with regard to the flag pole, um, I think I can agree with. Uh, my colleagues' estimation about it, and I, I would like to see it reduced in length by the two feet that was mentioned in order to approve it. The, the air conditioner unit really is, you know, my visceral response to it was that it was highly visible. And then when you, you and I, I recall my reaction in traveling through Asia where you see these things, mm -hmm tacked to the outside of, of masonry buildings all over the place, and, and it's like a, a pox. Um, mm -hmm. However, in this particular situation, um, as I'm, I'm really, I'm appalled by the number of window air conditioners actually that project from building facades in the city. And given actually, for me, it, what it comes down to is, is Comparing this air conditioner, you know, none of them end up being truly temporary. People cover the, the projecting window air conditioners with now with shiny silver material in the winter time. Nobody wants to move them inside because then you're giving up space. So they stay in the windows throughout the winter. In this particular case, I find this one to be less objectionable than most projecting window air conditioners, but uh, what I would like to see is an investigation of the unit being painted a darker color. I, I think the fact that it's recessed, the whole window bay is recessed within the masonry, makes it a, a better option actually because it doesn't project out into the street. But I would like to, to see investigated the possibility of, of moving it further in putting it behind louvers perhaps, or if that's not practicable, um, darkening the unit itself, painting it dark uh, so that it is less visible. John. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made. Uh, the flagpole I can accept based on everything that has been said about it, um, providing it's made shorter. And the window unit, I think that there's got to be some solution to be able to keep it. Um, and maybe it is painting it out, but I would let, um, I would suggest that the applicant work with the staff to finalize this. Um, <coughs> I'd hate to see it have to be taken out uh, under the circumstances and have some ugly air conditioner that's sticking out over the sill go in instead. Um, but there has to be a better solution to it, which I'm sure that you can work out with staff, so I would be willing to do that. You know, an adjustment 
Yes, on the flagpole. Yeah. So, yeah. six votes for the flagpole. Yes. And, and shorter. And the... Um, we can work with the I think the, the air conditioner, if they can camouflage it further, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on the AC, with all our recommendations. The placement of it and the finish. Yeah, right. placement and finish, yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. Um, okay. Yeah, we do. Six votes for the flagpole, correct? And for the AC? To do that exploration? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. We'll close the hearing, please, with a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. And I'll do the certificate of appropriateness for um, 80 Worcester Street, Soho Cast Iron District. Uh, Beaux Arts style stores and storerooms uh, building designed by Schellinger and built in 1894. Application is to legalize the installation of uh, mechanical equipment and a flagpole without LPC permit. Noting that the style, scale, materials, and details of the building are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Soho Historic District recommend approval of the uh, approval, finding that the uh, flagpole modifications. with modifications, that, wow. that, that the proposed uh, unit, they were doing air conditioner first, did not cause damage to any significant historic fabric and is easily reversible, uh, that because the flagpole has been, was installed at a time when the staff could, uh, could approve flagpoles, uh, the installation of this one is consistent with, the, with uh, our regulatory history here in this district and will not set a precedent for a future approval of flagpoles on this street or anywhere else. And uh, there are uh, very few, finally, uh, flagpoles on this street and the installation will not overwhelm, I mean, sort of that argument that you made will not overwhelm or obscure the architectural features of this facade, uh, these facades. However, we will work, uh, urge you, you will work with the staff to reduce the length of the flagpole, and then you'll work on your uh, unit to be sure that that uh, modifies the placement and the finish. Second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's approved. Thank you. Thank you.